Hi, everyone. So today I want to talk about a very special class of functions called harmonic functions. And harmonic functions arise in a lot of very important problems in physics originally. And they turn out to have deep connections to uh, the study of analytic functions and complex analysis. And this is one of the reasons why complex analysis is so useful in the physical sciences, uh, you, despite the, what you might say, unnatural appearance of the imaginary constant, we're still talking about functions that arise from and are connected to physical problems and the solutions to physical problems. So we'll talk more about harmonic functions when we get deeper into the course. Um, for now, there are certain properties that harmonic functions solve that have very useful consequences for the behavior of analytic functions. So uh, we're gonna define a harmonic function in the following way. So we have a function u of x and y, which is a real valued function on real variables. And that function is defined in a disk. Um, we call that function harmonic if the second derivatives of u exist. So all the second partials exist. Um, and those second partials are continuous. And moreover, the pure second partials, uxx and uyy, satisfy what's called Laplace's equation, which is uxx plus uyy is equal to zero. And solutions to Laplace's equation arise as part of the study of uh, heat. Um, this is where they were originally developed. Um, one of the most useful properties that harmonic functions have, and we're not going to go very much into this, but they satisfy a property called the maximum principle. So we're not going to prove this. But the maximum principle says that if you have a function defined on a domain, and that function satisfies the maximum principle, what it means is the minimum of the function and the maximum of the function cannot occur on the interior of the disk. They must occur on the boundary. And this is sort of physically motivated uh, from the distribution of heat is why you might suspect this is true. And it turns out that functions that satisfy that property are incredibly useful. Um, if you remember from your multivariable calculus, finding maximums and minimums of functions is actually quite difficult. If we have a harmonic function, we know that maxes and mins cannot occur on the interior of a domain, but must occur on the boundary. And that turns out to be incredibly useful in all kinds of situations. So to reiterate, the maximum principle says, um, or you know, harmonic functions then uh, satisfy the maximum principle. This is a theorem that we will not prove, but a harmonic function u of x, y defined on a disk attains its maximum and minimum value on the boundary of the disk, or the function is constant. So a typical proof uh, strategy that shows up in more complicated scenarios is if you can show that a function, a harmonic function attains its max or min on the interior of its domain, then that function must have been constant. Okay. So harmonic functions have a quick check associated with them, just like analytic functions do. Analytic functions, we can check to C or analytic by seeing that they satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Harmonic functions, we just check they satisfy Laplace's equation. So here's a function. We can check this function as harmonic by checking its second partials and seeing that they satisfy uh, Laplace's equation. So let's compute this in good practice. Uh, so ux, the first x derivative of u, is 24xy plus 15 plus 2. Uh, uxx is 24y, and I guess we drop our voices because, uh, oh, there's a y here. Uh, it's 24y. Uy is uh, 12x squared minus 12y squared plus 2x, and uyy is minus 24y. And we drop our voices again, and it's pretty apparent that uxx plus uyy, which is equal to 24y minus 24y, is equal to 0. And so therefore, u is harmonic. And the typical order of ideas we use here is once we know that a function is harmonic, then we get to assert things like, well, then that means it must not have a maximum or minimum on the interior of its domain. So that's normally a property that we inherit from harmonic functions. OK, so let's talk about the connection between harmonic and analytic functions, which I actually think is kind of surprising. Um, 
It turns out to be the case that analytic functions are built from harmonic pieces. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a function f of z defined in terms of its real and imaginary parts, so u, x, y is the real part of f, and v, x, y is the imaginary part of f, um, and that function is analytic on a disk, then both the pieces u and v are harmonic on the interior. Um, so yeah, so the imaginary part of f of z is the function u of x, y, and the real part of f of z is v of, uh, why am I writing this backwards? Sorry, the real part of f of z and the imaginary part of f of z is v of x, y, and these are both harmonic functions. It's not hard to see why, because uh, this is, follows immediately from the combination of two facts. First, we know that the Cauchy-Riemann equations hold, which means it must be the case that ux is equal to vy, and uy is equal to minus vx. So that's by the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And then we get a further fact, which asserts that mixed partials of, um, of functions that have continuous second derivatives must be equal to each other. In fact, that's, that's called Clairaut's theorem. So Clairaut's theorem says that if you have a function that is C2, so I'll remind you what Clairaut's theorem is. This is a, one of the central facts, actually, of derivatives in uh, the calculus of two variables. Uh, so Clairaut's theorem says that if u is class C2, so that is it has second partial derivatives that are all continuous, then uxy is equal to uyx. That is, mixed partials are equal to each other. So if you combine the fact that this is true with the fact that this is, then you end up with uh, an assertion of harmonicity. So if you take this and you take its x derivative, you end up with uxx is equal to vxy. And if you take the y derivative of this equation, you end up with uyy is equal to minus vxy. Sorry, I have done this in the backwards order here. Let me get my notation correct. The x derivative of vy is vyx. The y derivative of minus vx is minus vxy by taking partial derivatives. And then Clairaut's theorem says that these things are, uh, are equal to each other, which means that it must be the case that uxx is equal to minus uyy. And thus, uxx plus uyy is equal to 0. And likewise, you can take the derivatives in the opposite order, and that will show you that vxx plus vyy is equal to 0. So analytic functions have harmonic real and imaginary parts. It turns out to be the case that that theorem actually holds in the other direction as well in kind of a weird way, which is if you start with a harmonic function, you're guaranteed to get an analytic function from just a harmonic function, which might seem kind of surprising, actually, because a harmonic function is a real valued function with real variables. And what the theorem says, uh, so this is a theorem about an object called harmonic conjugates. A harmonic conjugate is a function that is guaranteed to exist. If I give you a function u, I can derive a function v, which we also call u star, which is its harmonic conjugate. And the harmonic conjugate has the property that if I take that function, if I take a function and I define it to be u plus i u star, f is automatically an analytic function. So the idea here is that if I start with a u harmonic on a disk, I can derive a u star, which is harmonic on the same disk. And then I can define f of z is equal to u of xy plus i u star of xy. And this function is automatically analytic. 
So the relationship between harmonic and analytic functions is very deep. If I have an analytic function, it has harmonic pieces. If I have a harmonic function, I can always define an analytic function out of it. We'll see that this is also is going to imply one of the most important theorems in complex analysis, which is the maximum modulus principle. So we don't have maxims and mins anymore because we're in complex variables, but the maximum principle applied to harmonic functions carries over into saying something about the possible size that a analytic function can be on a disk as well. The most important step in the proof of this, which I'm not gonna go through in this video, the most important step here is a way of coming up with the harmonic conjugate given the original function. Now, this is the formula right here, and it looks kind of fancy, but uh, ultimately what that corresponds to is the method of partial integration that you would have seen in uh, the calculus of several variables or in differential equations when you're attempting to reconstruct a function uh, that is a from its partial derivatives. If I have a bunch of partial derivatives of a function and I'm trying to recover the original, then I have to use a technique called partial integration to do it. So I'm actually going to work through an example in two different ways where we write down the harmonic conjugate of a function, one using the formula, and second using the sort of calculus two idea of building our way back up using partial integration. All right. So here's our example function that we're going to work with. Uh, that's u of x and y is equal to x squared plus y squared plus 6x plus 2y. And this function turns out to be harmonic everywhere. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down what the formula is, and then we're going to explain how the pieces work. So the formula says that the harmonic conjugate of the function u should be given to us by the integral from x naught to x of minus the y partial derivative of u integrated in the x variable. plus the integral from uh, y naught to y of the x partial derivative of u integrated in the y variable. Uh, with the important consideration here that this is done at a base point. So we should explain that when I say x naught y naught here, uh, this is a base point. So it's some point in the domain on which this function is harmonic. And what I'm going to do when I can is I'm going to choose that to be 0, 0, because it's the easiest possible point to work with. Since we were told this thing is harmonic everywhere, I'm going to choose my base point x naught y naught to be 0. And so our first simplification is to use that to say that we're going to do uh, the harmonic conjugate of u is the integral from 0 to x of minus uy s y ds plus the integral from 0 to y of ux 0 t dt. And now I just need to calculate what these pieces are. And hopefully what I've come up with is the complex conjugate. Um, so let's actually calculate what ux and uy are. If u is equal to x squared plus y squared plus 6x plus 2y, then the x partial derivative of that is 2x plus 6. And the x partial derivative of that evaluated at 0t is equal to 6. On the other hand, uy is equal to 2y plus 2. And uy evaluated at s comma y is equal to 2y plus 2. There are no x's, so there's no s's to substitute in to integrate. So we're basically doing a constant integration in that setting. So, oh, this is a, do I have these backwards? No, this is right. No, OK. OK, so let's put into our formulas and see what we get. So the complex conjugate is equal to the integral from 0 to x of this piece, which I have right here. Plus this piece, which I have right here. And then just using the standard uh, uh, 
you know, I mean, this is just a regular old integration at this point. It's barely complex analysis here, right? This is a, a lesson in remembering how the, the, the calculus of two variables works. Um, what you should end up with here uh, is 2xy plus 2x plus 6y. And plus 2x, plus a negative sign somewhere. I did, there's a typo here. This is supposed to be a minus sign. So I hope you'll forgive me for fixing this on the fly. This is a minus sign. That's a minus sign. That's a minus sign. That's a minus sign. And that's a minus sign. And then we're done. Okay, so I'll fix that in the notes. But the idea is that is the complex conjugate of u. Now I have to fix the minus sign because I didn't verify that with the plus sign in there, it's a harmonic function, right? So we gotta be really careful with that. Okay. Um, so that's it. That's the complex conjugate of u. And so the assertion here is that I could build an analytic function f of z, which is equal to x squared plus, sorry, minus y squared plus 6x plus 2y plus i times uh, 2xy minus 2x plus 6y. And th this function will be analytic. Of course, it's obviously analytic in this case because we're dealing with polynomials, but that's the idea. A harmonic function can be used to generate a harmonic conjugate, which will be the imaginary part of an analytic function. Here's a process for doing that. Okay, so let's actually do it the other way with the cauchy riemann equations, which is uh, oftentimes easier to do and more elegant. So to do it in the other way, what we can do is we can start with u, which was x squared minus y squared plus 6x plus 2y. And then we can compute ux and uy. So ux is 2x plus 6, and uy is equal to minus 2y plus 2. And then we can use the cauchy riemann equations to notice that ux must also be equal to vy. So vy is 2x plus 6. And vx, negative, must be equal to minus 2y plus 2, which means that vx must be equal to 2y minus 2. And now we can use the method of partial integration to recover what v must have been. If I recover v, by integrating vy with respect to y. So v will be the integral of 2x plus 6 dy. Then you end up with 2xy plus 6y plus possibly a function of x that got destroyed when I took the partial derivative. Then I have to come back and I compare that. If I like, I can take the derivative of this with respect to x. So that will give me vx is equal to, well, 2y plus zero plus g prime of x. And if I compare this to this, I can see that it must be the case that g prime of x was equal to minus two, which means g of x was equal to minus two x. And that tells me that my complete solution, here's v right there, now I've solved for g of x, I get v is equal to two xy plus six y minus two x. What you'll notice is the same thing I got right here. It's kind of more elegantly done, though, because I can work directly with integrals instead of in terms of the defining formula that shows up in the proof. In both cases, I mean, you know, the examples that we can compute are pretty easy. Normally, um, we're, we're, yeah, in practice, a lot of times what we're doing is we're working uh, 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 with theoretical ideas instead of ap uh, actual ideas. But what do I mean by that? I don't know. Whatever. Ignore me. So the point is that like we get this sort of profound connection between so the point of all of this. That there's a deep connection between harmonic functions that satisfy uxx plus uyy is equal to 0 in analytic functions, which satisfy ux is equal to vy and uy is equal to minus vx. 
And that connection actually points to the existence of some pretty powerful geomet or geometric interpretations that you can take about what it means to be an analytic function and how that connects up to the idea of what harmonic functions are doing. So I mentioned in an earlier video that ultimately what's going on in the background here is that there's some connection to what are what are called conservative vector fields. Which is another way that this stuff all links up with uh, the ideas of physics. So when I put this together, uh, I encourage you to check out a video that shows how vector fields uh, tie in in the relation to this and how there's sort of this geometry behind analytic functions that give them a lot of the properties that they have. All right. So that's enough to get started on the homework for this. Uh, what we'll move on to next time is we'll start talking about line integrals or how we integrate in complex analysis. And where that's going to begin is basically extending the ideas of contour integration from several variable calculus to complex analysis using the typical z is equal to x plus i, y trick. And so integration in complex analysis basically maps into contour integration uh, in uh, two variable calculus. All right. See you next time.